once you get through this, I don't know if people really had a business continuity plan or a crisis management plan before this, but you need to put together some type of crisis management team, look what you did well, look what you didn't do so well, and really write that crisis management business continuity plan. That will serve you not only for infectious diseases, but any type of critical incident that your company may be exposed to in the future. Because I guarantee companies that were up and running really quickly were the ones that had some type of critical incident business continuity plan. So that's another thing that you gotta take a look at. We're so busy just reacting, but now we gotta start being a little bit more proactive of what we're doing to transition and then what we need to do for the future. Welcome back to the Healthy Business Podcast. Next up, we have Lori Miller. She's back. She's from Developing Professionals, and she is going to talk about everything that you need to do and need to know in order to safely bring your employees back. Face it, it's a lot of additional work, and it's going to cost even more. And you want to make sure you're doing it right because there's also a lot of liability, potential liability associated with it. So Lori breaks it down for us, makes it easy for us, and also shares four or five resources with us that are going to be part of the show notes to make it very easy. One-stop shopping. You can pull it all down here. So next up, Lori Miller from Developing Professionals. All right, I'm here with Lori Miller. She's the owner of Developing Professionals, and she's the first return interview. Lori, congratulations. (laughs) Will I get an Emmy for this? (laughs) (laughs) We'll find out. Why don't you start out? Tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit more about Developing Professionals. Okay, good. So for those of you that saw my last podcast with Tony, uh, yeah, my company is Developing Professionals. So I've been in business now for 16 years. Um, I started the company after I left UPS. And so basically I provide uh, soft skills training, so interpersonal skills training in like six different areas. Um, I do some executive coaching um, with individuals and then also consulting. So process improvement, organizational development, and instructional design for clients. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. You were kind enough. So I'm going to read all this. You were, you were kind enough to send me a list of, of information. So I'm going to read them all out to you. Okay. The COVID-19 back to work schedule checklist, mm-hmm. the employee health screening form template, yep. the sample memo to go to employees about screening procedures, the return to work PPT deck guide that can be customized based on individual business plan. Yep. The New York state business reopening template that every organization needs to have posted on site and the safe work playbook for those who want to go deep dive and ensure all parts of the business is covered. You know, after I looked at just the list, I, I realize why some of my clients don't even want to open up because there's yeah. just so much there. I mean, where where do they begin, Lori? Um, that's a great question, Tony. And so I think when clients are facing them, I think we're in phase two right now, phase three is coming. Um, one, I think you need to determine and analyze are you at a state of readiness to open up? Just because the state says you're ready, it doesn't mean that you can open your doors and employees are ready to get back to work. So I think like anything that you do, you have to do like a reality assessment right now. One, and this is probably the the, the first and foremost, is within New York State, you always have to follow guidelines and policy. So as you read the list, so New York State is requiring a safety plan template. And you have to complete this and it has to be posted on your site um, of your organization. You do not have to file it with the state, but if a CDC representative, a government agency comes in, they're gonna wanna see this. This is where you need to start. Um, I, of course, have forwarded to you, if you go to um, any New York State website, there's a lot of resources out there. They've provided this template. That's where you start. You got to go through it and they'll actually tell you what you need to do for your people as far as what the requirement is are if you're bringing employees back, Um, like the six foot distancing, are you requiring them to wear a mask, 
Are you doing the screening? So the things that you need to do to keep your people, your employees safe. It also gives you if you actually, whether you're a B2B or a B2O, uh, or I'm sorry, business to consumer or business to business. If you have customers or vendors that are also on your site, they're coming to your place of business, you also have to identify what you're gonna do for the safety of the people that you're serving, your external customers. So you need to go through that. Also, your physical environment. If you have a brick and mortar, what is your physical property going to look like? Are your break rooms open? Um, do you have hand sanitizers throughout the property? We went to this open concept, right? Um, many, many years ago, instead of everyone having the corner office, open cubicles. So now if that's your physical property, what do you need to do so you can actually have people working alongside one another, but they're not on top of another and still experience that six feet distancing. So I know companies right now are doing like an environmental assessment of their physical property, making sure that they can have people still come back to work, but still follow those protocols. The other thing too, then if you have um, people that share desks or areas, what is the appropriate protocol for cleaning in between those? Do you have maintenance people that will be cleaning? Are you requiring your employees to clean before and after? So those are all things that you need to consider before even opening up. And the other part too, which we'll talk a little bit about this, is what policies have changed. So you've got to make sure you have documented, well-written policies that have changed as a result of COVID-19 and also how your business operation has changed. You got to get those written because you got to communicate those to your employees whether they're returning from a furlough or layoff, you're hiring new employees. So those are all the critical things that you need to have in place before you even open. And I think that will give you the framework um, and the guidelines. Okay, we've got all these things. Now we start bringing people back. What do we need to do then for communications and training with them? So that's where I would definitely start. So this, this like I said, this template is really good. This is what you need to have in place. And then, um, the back to work checklist, um, I belong to SHRM, the Society for Human Resources Management. They've been providing great resources to keep all business owners, all HR professionals on top of what you need to do to make sure that you're managing uh, the transition back to this new normal. So they had provided some key areas and that's what, I won't do a deep dive with it, but number one, the thing you need to be aware of is workplace safety. What are all the things that you need to do for that? Number two, if you're going to bring being, bringing people back, you have to have recall procedures. And if you're a union shop, you know, what is the protocol that you have to follow based on the collective bargaining agreement? Um, if you're not a union shop, who are you bringing back? How are you going to communicate? And then what you're going to need to do to re-onboard them to the new realities for your business. During this time, employee benefits may have shifted. Compensation may have changed. Um, if you lowered managers' salaries. Um, so what is the changes in that and what you need to communicate to your employees? And once again, changing those policies in your employee handbook. The other thing that's gonna be a big shift, if you were continuing to work during this COVID-19 and you were essential personnel and you now have people working remotely, you gotta figure out what the plan is for moving forward. Are you gonna require them to come back right away? Um, are you going to um, have a couple days where they can work from home? You need to figure that out. I've been working with several clients right now and some of them are saying, you're working remotely to the end of the year. So the remote work policy and what you're requiring, that also has to be factored in. And then also um, new hire paperwork. Even if you've laid off and furloughed employees, things may have changed. So even though um, you may have done the, the paperwork previously, any part of your no-hire uh, processing, any employees you bring back, make sure they go through all of that again. And then last but not least, um, you know, your business continuity plans. I did crisis management for UPS um, after September 11th. There's prevention, response, restoration. We're in the, still in the response phase, but now we're gonna be moving into restoration. Once you get through this, I don't know if people really had a business continuity plan or a crisis management plan before this, but you need to put together some type of crisis management team 
look what you did well, look what you didn't do so well, and really write that crisis management business continuity plan. That will serve you not only for infectious diseases, but any type of critical incident that your company may be exposed to in the future. Because I guarantee companies that were up and running really quickly were the ones that had some type of critical incident business continuity plan. So that's another thing that you got to take a look at. We're so busy just reacting, but now we got to start being a little bit more proactive of what we're doing to transition and then what we need to do for the future. So those are some things. I know it's a lot to uh, factor, um, but those are kind of like the, the high level things that I really think uh, organizations need to focus their energies on. Got it. Thank you. Um, now, some of my clients, you know, they're talking about how they have to keep a log. Uh, they have to take everybody's temperature every day and, and, and all of that. Can you just add a little more uh, uh, definition to, to what the expectation is? Yeah. So, um, so one of the things that you need to do is you got to communicate with your employees what you're doing as an organization, what you're doing as a business owner, what you're doing as a manager, and what you expect your employees to do. So there are some guidelines that you have to have in place. So you have to do some type of employee screening. So for example, um, you can have screeners. So if you have a place where people, a staffing door where everyone enters the building, you can actually identify someone who's the actual screener that will screen employees before they actually enter your property. This screener can actually take the individual's temperature. There's a series of questions that you ask. Um, and then if you are um, uh, good to go, then you actually will be moving on to your company's property. One way of doing it, you have someone ask the questions, you're actually taking their temperature, um, you require people to sanitize their hands before they enter the building, and if you're requiring masks, making sure you're providing them with a mask or they're bringing one to work. So those are the things you need to do for that checklist. You can also have employees do it themselves, and then you can create a log, and what the employee does is once they enter your physical property, they take their own temperature, they record it, uh, they check off on the questions that they have to respond, which is a no, you know, have they had a fever in the last 24 hours? Um, are they having difficulty breathing? Um, you know, have they been tired, lethargic? You know, so a variety of questions. They sign off on that and then they're able to uh, enter the building. The same thing you can do with that screening for employees, you could do that with customers too. So, um, so that's what all organizations are gonna be required to do. How you do it, it's up to you to determine what's gonna work best for your organization. Uh, my husband, you know, I told you last time he works for National Grid, they actually have technology that, that they're rolling out, I believe today, that every employee has to go into the, this, this platform, answer the questions, make sure that they, they, what we just talked about, and if they're clear to go, then they can come to work. If not, if they've answered no to some of those questions, it goes to a designated person, they will talk to them, and they may, may not be able to come to work that day because they answered no to a couple of those questions. So there's also technology out there that companies can invest in that employees have to do that before they start their work time. Wow, well, yeah, I, I've, uh, I've heard that now it's becoming uh, a little more time consuming too because not every employee fills out the form every day and now uh, they're chasing employees. Yeah, so you have to check some balances in place. So just like we do anything with, with individuals, there needs to be training, communication, and accountability. And so if by chance they're, they're self-assessing, you have to have someone that's monitoring and tracking that so you've got those sheets and you've got those on record. Yeah, well you, well, you know, that plus all the additional PPE that uh, employers have to pay for, I yeah. guess, do you have any idea how long they're going to have to do something like this? You know what, that's a good question. Um, you know, when it comes to health and safety, OSHA standards, it'll be interesting if this becomes the new reality that we're going to have to face with. Mm. We don't know what's going to happen next, but you know what? I wouldn't be surprised if this becomes part of the protocol. Will we have to wear masks forever? It becomes part of our uniform. I don't think so. Um, however, until we believe this is still a highly contagious disease and we don't have a vaccine for it, 
I think this is going to be the normal until they find some type of vaccine or they can get it into control. So, and they don't know enough about this disease at this point, you know? So, right. um, so be, until we, we have answers, I think this is going to be the new way of life for many of us. So all that we're doing now, uh, these new uh, procedures, should they be included in an employee manual or is this more short term where they shouldn't be? You know what, that's, that, that's another good question. Um, so we have an employee handbook. Um, one, everyone should have an, an infectious disease policy. Um, and it kind of covers a lot of stuff that you know, we've all been talking about. So I definitely think your infectious disease policy should be a new permanent policy for your employee handbook. Um, some of the things that may be temporary, what I would encourage employers to do is to have a policy which a, which a time frame on it. So this will be till you know, December 2021, let's say for an example. And then at that point in time, you'll be able to determine is this a permanent policy or this is just a temporary one that we need to have in place. Um, with that, it also gives you a little bit of latitude. Um, you know, it's very costly when you have employee handbooks if you're giving them a hard copy one. If you've got it on your employee portal or your, you know, area where employees can access it, you know, make sure you have it up there and you don't have to reproduce all of your employee handbooks at this point in time, but just make sure you're distributing it. They have it as part of their copy with whatever hard copy employee handbook they currently have. And then also that if you know it becomes permanent, you've made some significant changes with your policies through COVID-19, that's when I would suggest re-updating um, your handbook and making sure everyone has a brand new copy of that. Yeah, yeah. So is this going to be something similar to OSHA where I'm assuming that the, the state can't afford to, to now audit the logs and, and things like that. So is this more of an OSHA style uh, result if things go bad that it would be maybe an employee that would call in? Yeah. So, so you know, OSHA is put in place to make sure we're following safe health and safety protocols to keep our employees protected and safe when they're coming to work. Mm -hmm. So while I think employers need to be responsible, employees need to be responsible, I would venture to say, you know, once we get through this phase, OSHA will be the one that probably will have the responsibility to come in and making sure some of the stuff that we put in place as a result of COVID-19 is actually happening. So I definitely think they're going to be the regulatory compliance agency that's going to make sure some of this stuff is continuing to happen if it becomes something that needs to be permanent within your organization. That's interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The uh, remote working. So yes. what some of my clients are, are seeing is that uh, as the employees are out there longer, mm -hmm. uh, some employees are taking advantage of being remote. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, so what advice do you have? Have you, are you seeing that? And what advice are you giving regarding that? Um, I, I always go back to, you know, business 101. What makes sense for your business? Not what makes sense for your employees. Mm -hmm. And that's just my HR business owner cap coming on. So you go back to, um, and there's some percentages and, you know, um, I don't know if I have it. I'm so bad with numbers. They don't store in my brain. Um, but so in the beginning, before this all happened, there was, I think it was like 29% of individuals were actually working remotely. And now, of course, all these people we learned can work remotely. So some of us baby boomers, generation Xers, like, no, we got to come in. We got to be in the clock, you know, punch the clock. You got to be there from 8 to 4.30. People need to see you. Well, that mindset has shifted. So one, we know... It can work. We've got the technology. People are being productive. They're getting the work done. We're not having to have all these people come into this brick and mortar. It's saving time going to and from work. Some people travel to work one hour here, one hour there, traveling time to meetings. So I think we found it's definitely a good, efficient model for some people. On the other hand, you have other individuals that may not have the discipline or the accountability um, and so I think you need to evaluate, one, who it works for based on their role and responsibility. That really doesn't have to come in. First and foremost, don't look at the individual. You got to look at the job role. Then you need to determine for you to run your business who needs to physically be at the place and who can work from home. 
And you need to be consistent with that based on your job roles and the tasks they do for your organization. You can't make exceptions. You got two people doing the same job. One's got kids, they wanna stay working from home because they don't have daycare. You gotta be consistent across the board. Um, if it can work for your employees, it can work for you, then have a consistent policy in place that needs to be across the board. And that's what I'm advising my clients. Um, I remember when I started my career in HR, and I don't know if I shared this story um, last time I was on your, your podcast, um, but an HR director told me one time, because I wanted to make an exception for one of our employees for whatever, and I was an HR rep. And I said to him, I go, well, we need to do what's right for the employee. He said, Lori, no good deed goes unpunished. I'm like, you're HR, how can you say that, right? right? But it's true, you have to do things that's fair and consistent. And if you do it for one, it's going to come back to bite you because someone's going to want to do it. And then if they're a protected class, there could be discrimination claims. So you have to be fair and consistent with your remote work policy. You got to figure that out. What works for the business? If it works for the business, then you go ahead and you can make some adjustments and adaptations. Excellent. Thank you. Um, when you first were explaining the, the five or six items that I, that you gave, you shared with me, yeah. uh, I, I, I can just imagine that a, a business owner is listening to that and thinking, I, I don't have time for any of this. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense now for them to just uh, maybe sign up with some kind of an HR group or something like that to get assistance? Yeah. And it's so funny because, you know, my lane, I work with small, medium sized businesses. You know, I've got some bigger clients and stuff. They bring me in for training or a special project, but I'll, I've been talking with a lot of small business owners like, I don't have time for this. I don't know how to do it. They've also, if they haven't had a designated HR manager or someone overseeing a lot of this stuff, they're like, I need someone to do this. So I've been advising them. You don't know what your business model is going to look down the road. Hire an HR consultant, like anything you do. Hire that gap person that can manage this stuff for you to get you over the hump. And then once you do that, you may determine, okay, I need to hire someone part-time or full-time or I need to have someone that I have on retainer that can do some of these things uh, for you. It's just like for me, you know what? I'm working, you know, got a house. Like I hire people to do the things that I don't want to do, like cleaning my house, right? Yeah. You know, a person that has it as an expertise, hire them. And it, it could be a, for a short term thing, but bring someone on board that has the expertise that can do all these things for you. Um, it's well worth the investment. So that's what I'm really telling individuals to do. Find people that have the expertise, bring them on board. They'll help you get through this, navigate this. And then you can determine, do I need to keep this person? Do I need to hire, still have this consultant? Or, you know, they got me through the hump. I'm good. So that's what consultants do. We come in, we help, we serve, and then we move on to help the next individual. Excellent. Very good. Um, yeah. As, as the business owners are focusing so much on COVID and coming back and, and, and following these new procedures, mm -hmm. what are they not focusing on right now? Yeah, and, and that's a great question. So we still need to run our business, right? right? So the key thing, even before this, you know, and why you do what you do, what I, I do what I do, it's really about making sure your employees um, have the tools, the training, the information that they need. That's not going to change. So you have to take a look at what is your communications plan? What is your training plan? You still need to have that, regardless if we're reacting and responding to COVID-19 and all this craziness that we've had to readjust and shift for. So one, develop your communications plan. What do I need to communicate with my employees on a regular basis, whether they're working remotely or whether they're on site? Same thing too with your customers. Um, when I worked for UPS, one of my responsibilities was to write a pre-work communications meeting. It's called the PCM. Every single day, Every single employee got a pre-work communications meeting that the manager was responsible for sharing with their employees. So daily communications is critical. So what's your daily communication plan? Are you having weekly huddle meetings, monthly check-in meetings? So you gotta have a communications plan to keep your employees up to speed what's going on. Not only with COVID-19, but everything within the business. They wanna feel safe, they wanna feel secure, especially if they're coming back and they just had a layoff. Is this gonna happen again? Regular communication is key. The other thing too, is you got some training that needs to happen, right? 
The annual sexual harassment workplace uh, training needs to occur on an annual basis. So what are you gonna be doing for that? These compliance things don't go away. OSHA compliance training, job methods training, uh, skill and behavioral based training. So what are you doing for that? So that's another thing. What's your training and communication plan? Classroom led training probably is not gonna be existent for a while. Unless you have smaller groups, you can still allow for that six feet distancing. So how are you converting some of your training into a web-based platform, whether it's Zoom, whether it's um, Microsoft Teams, whether it's WebEx? So you wanna make sure you're looking at all the training my employees need to go through and how we are transferring that to an application that we can still meet all those requirements. So that's another area where I've kind of found a little bit of a niche now, converting all of my training into a web-based platform where I used to go in and do a full day leadership management training for a staff of new managers. So now what we're doing is we're chunking that out into smaller mini modules where we're now doing it virtually. So um, that's another area. What is all that training that people need to go through and how are we going to deliver it? And if we have to convert it to a new way of delivering, how we're gonna do that. Once again, if you can't do it, you hire someone that's able to transition all that stuff for you. Right, right. That's another key area that I think people aren't thinking about, but that's gonna be a red flag as they start bringing people back. Hiring new employees, what's your onboarding process look like? You know, yeah. so those are all critical pieces. Well, and I highly recommend to the listeners to uh, hire Lori. I mean, that'll, she'll help you get there faster. She'll, <laughs> she'll basically, you know, she'll give you the roadmap. Uh, <laughs> Exactly. You know the speed that I work. It'll be done tomorrow. Right on. Right on. Uh, Lori Miller, owner of Developing Professionals. Lori, if anybody wants to get a hold of you, what's the best way to get, get you? Um, yeah, so I have a home-based office. So, of course, my, my telephone, which is listed on my website, or email, that's a great uh, format. So, And it's just my name, lmiller at developingprofessionals.com. So, and I'm out here anytime that, and if you have a question, I know we've given a lot of information. You give out great information, Tony. Um, so feel free to reach out for me, your listeners out there. If you need anything, you want a checklist, you know, I'm here to help you, you know, and we're all in this together. So, I, and I love what I do. So feel free to reach out for me um, anytime uh, for any of your listeners out there, if they need anything. And if I don't have the answer, I'll find the person that can give you the answer that you're looking for. Wonderful. And we'll have all the links in the show notes so that uh, they can okay. get to you right away. Lori, thank you so much for coming in for the second time. You did win your Emmy, so you're good to go. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And what is it? What is it? So the next will be the, the, the Tony, right? Oh, so, there you go. There you yeah, go. <laughs> yeah. So you're going to have to keep bringing me back, we, right? We, we definitely will. I mean, especially the, the way things are going. It seems like there's more HR need than ever before. Exactly. Exactly. I knew we'd have our place in history someday. <laughs> All right. Thanks again, Laurie. You take Thanks, care. Thanks, Tony. Always a pleasure. Thank you. You, you got it. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.